Grace and peace be to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are gathered today in Treaty 1 territory, which is the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. For thousands of years, Indigenous people walked this land and knew it to be the center of their lives and their spirituality. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Good morning all, I am Carol Fletcher and I am in team ministry with Jeff Cook here at Transcona Memorial United Church. We are joined in leadership this morning by Hannah Cole at the piano and Crystal Shaw, our director of music. We are, in, um, we are gathering today on Sunday, July the 17th, and we have a number of people with us from the visiting congregations of our area, and we are delighted that they are here. We begin our worship today singing a verse of There is Room for All. It is found in your order of service bulletin. It is also in the More Voices hymn book at number 62. And as you are able, I invite you to stand and join us as we sing. There is room for all. to number 142 where we sing O oh, a song must rise the soft cover hymn book 142 O oh, a song must rise <laughs> Thank you. 
invite you as you are able to join in the words of our opening prayer. Let us pray. God, during this time of worship, open our imaginations with stories of faith. Open our hearts with hymns of hope. Open our love with prayers of peace. Inspire us to be a people of worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When the uh, Tibajigan group decided that they wanted to have worship together, they imagined that maybe we would join ourselves together by singing verses of the same hymn each week. Now, it hasn't really happened so far, but we decided to give it a go with hopes that next week another verse of this hymn will be sung. So we're going to invite you to turn to uh, hymn 291 in Voices United. It's all things bright and beautiful. And um, as you see, it has a whole lot of verses. And we're only going to sing verse one, but we sing the chorus, the verse, and then the chorus. And so we sing hymn uh, 291 of all things bright and beautiful. During the summer, and uh, just before the summer, we at Transcona Memorial have been reading and worshiping our way through the Gospel of Luke. Today's reading comes from the 10th chapter of Luke. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. And may God speak to us through this reading of scripture. Amen. Our hymn is in Voices United, number 664, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And after this hymn, uh, any children present are invited to join Brenda, who will be taking them out for uh, some children and youth programming. Voices United, number 664.
imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I suspect some of us have heard that. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. It was said by Oscar Wilde, the 19th century Irish playwright, poet. And it sounds, I think at first hearing as a compliment. Certainly if you're the one being flattered, being imitated, it's flattering. And it sounds like the imitator is doing something nice to the one they're being imitated. But we don't usually hear the complete quote. The complete quote is, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery that mediocrity can pay to greatness. Ouch. <laughs> Suddenly, if you're the one that's imitating, you're going, okay, what that means is I'm mediocre. And it immediately begins to divide people. If you're imitating because you can't be great is what it implies. I think most people know though that that's too cynical because in order to develop skills, we do imitate others. Art students go and study the art of some of the great artists and they try to sketch those pieces. They imitate them in order to begin to develop their own skills. Musicians play other musicians' music. Preachers, particularly when we're starting out, here's a preacher that would go, that's really good. And whether we like it or not, next time we preach, we kind of sound like that person. If you're a tennis player, if you're a hockey player, if you're a golfer, you watch others doing it and you try it out. And eventually you begin to develop your own style, who you are and what works for you. But Wilde's comment, I think, speaks to an attitude that often is very prevalent. Our sense that somehow we need to define those who are mediocre and those who are great. We need to compare, we need to rank, we need to create our lists of the better and the not so good. Sports, I think, helps promote this. I remember this is the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Canada-Russia hockey series. You know, with the great Canadian question, where were you when Paul Henderson scored the goal in the eighth, eighth game? I was in high school when the game, those games were being played. And I remember as it got near the end of the series saying to another student, it seems to me it would be fitting if it ended up as a tie. And he said very vehemently, it can't be a tie, there has to be a winner. There has to be a winner. Oscar Wilde probably would have agreed. And it's an attitude that keeps popping up in the Bible. Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, bring a sacrifice to God. Abel brings a sheep. Cain, who's a farmer, brings produce from the crops. And we're told that God has regard for Abel's offering and no regard for Cain's. One's great, one's kind of mediocre. And there's no explanation. God just says to Cain, do what is right and you will be accepted, which isn't all that helpful. If anything, it just simply seems to say life isn't always fair. But as we hear that story, because it's in the Bible, we want to say, well, it must be right. There must have been something wrong with Cain's. But I think, for me anyways, there's also something that feels that's just not fair to Cain. And I get that same feeling when I read today's story from the gospel. Jesus and his disciples arrive at the home and Martha greets them. We're told greets them, welcomes them to her home. And the Greek word for welcome is the same word used when Zacchaeus welcomes Jesus to his home in Acts when Jason welcomes Paul and Silas to his home. It's the word of somebody who has the authority of being the head of the household. But we're told that after welcoming Jesus and his friends, Martha is distracted by many tasks. Not told what she's doing, but she's doing something. Maybe she's folding the laundry. 
But her sister Mary, we're told, sits at the feet of Jesus and listens to what he's saying. And after a while, Martha has just had enough of this. She says to Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, Martha. You're so worried and distracted. There's need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part. It will not be taken from her. Mary has chosen the better part. Ouch. If you're Martha, how do you hear that? Your sister chose door number one. Sorry, you picked number two. And we're not told what Martha was doing. Often I've heard this priest as if Martha's preparing supper for him. She's doing, but it doesn't say that. She could be doing anything. And maybe just Jesus is just thinking, I'm only here for a little while, so you don't need to do all that. You need to listen, which is what Mary is doing. But it seems a little unfair. Now, lots of preachers reach the point where we come to kind of the great Canadian solution. And what we say is, we need both Mary and Martha's. We need both the people who are busy and the people who listen. And we particularly need those in the churches because we don't want to say Mary's got it and have all the Bible study people go, we pick the best part and all the building and property people going, well, what the heck are we doing cutting the lawn and changing the furnace filters then? But we need both. And that seems to fit other passages. Paul says, you know, we're one body, many members, hands, eyes, ears. We all have different skills and gift. It makes some of psychology's insights. If you take Myers-Briggs or Enneagram personalities, they'll tell you we react differently and see and perceive life differently. Maybe it's just a both and. But what stopped me when I read the passage this week is it doesn't get there in the passage. Jesus doesn't say, God loves both of you for what you're doing. God doesn't say, you're both a blessing. Jesus doesn't say, you're both a blessing to me. It's just, Mary has chosen the better part. Now, it did occur to me, it may just be the way to get to Martha is to echo what she said, because she starts it. She says, my sister isn't following my agenda. My agenda is we got to do the housework. I've chosen the better part. This is what we should both be doing. And to that, Jesus responds, maybe Mary's chosen the better part. But it leaves us with that sense of, does one have to be better? We hear it in other places. James and John say to Jesus, which one of us will have the best place when your kingdom comes? Who gets the place of honor to sit on your right hand? Who gets to be the better and have the better post? And Jesus' responses are always, want to be great, be a servant. Want to be great, be as a child. You want to be great, it's going to involve a cross. You want to be first, learn to be last. You want to discover what life in God is like and be prepared to lose your life. Somehow Jesus always seems to say, when we get into that ranking and having to say one is better than the other, wherever we are, we're not quite where God wants us to be. So as I read this this week, and came to that end and thought, I'm not happy with the ending of the story. I thought, well, maybe this is a parable. Because my reading of parables is that's where they leave us. They don't give us a nice, neat finish. They leave us going, what the heck? What do we do with this? What does God do with this? Reminds me of the story of the prodigal son, where the end is the dysfunctional family are out in the yard. And the elder son is saying, no way I'm going in there to celebrate that my brother, that he's back. 
And they use the terms, the elder brother says to the father, this son of yours wasted everything. And the father says, but this brother of yours. And we get the same dynamic here. Martha going, this disciple of yours isn't helping me. Jesus, this sister of yours is listening to what I have to say. So I want to, for a moment, treat this like a parable. As I say, parables, I don't think end discussions, they begin them. I think when Jesus told parables, he would have walked away and people would have been going, that's the end. And then the real stuff begins. Then the discussions begin. Then people start talking about, well, what would it feel like to be that person in the story? What is God really saying? How do we find reconciliation in these places? And out of that, community begins to grow and faith begins to deepen. So I want to suggest just a couple of the things that that kind of inner discussion going on in me happened as I read what I think is this parable of Mary, Martha, and Jesus. One of the things that occurred to me is that when we gather to worship, we listen to scripture, to the sermons, to prayers, to hymns. But if we stop at just listening, then we haven't finished our worship. We have to listen and we have to act. If we come to church and say, here it said, everybody is a child of God. And we go out saying, isn't it great how much God loves? And we go out loving God, but not loving all God's children. We haven't finished worship. Say everyone is a child of God. Is to say somehow the image of God lives in each one of us. That each of us is somehow embodies an expression of God, that somehow each of us is sacred, is divine. That we are not only in God, but God in us. Jesus can say, when you feed the hungry, when you visit the imprisoned, when you offer healing to anyone, you are doing it to me. See me within the weakest and the most vulnerable. Somehow, worship brings us into that saying, we need to practice seeing the image of God in other people, even the ones that are most difficult to see it in, particularly the ones it is most difficult to see them it in. We need to accept that life is a gift for all of us, that we all live by God's loving initiative, that somehow, even in the people we least expected, God might be present and speak to us. When I was thinking about this, I went onto YouTube and I went back and watched it. I cry every time I see this, and some of you may have seen it. The Britain has talent where the first time Susan Boyle was on, who has since then recorded a number of albums. But she came out on the stage and said she wanted to be a singer and wanted to have a career. And you could see the people on the panel just rolled their eyes. And they panned over the audience and you could see people the look on their faces seemed to be saying, this is just pathetic. This woman is going to make a fool of herself. And then she started to sing. And the, the people on the panel go, they're stunned. And after she's done, their comments are things like, you know, when you came out here, everybody was laughing at you. Everybody was against you. We just assumed that there could not be beauty, there could not be song, there could not be wonder, there could not be grace, there could not be blessing somehow in you. And there was. The American poet Mary Oliver once said, my work is loving the world, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. Sometimes that's easy when it's a sunset. It's a little tougher to look around at everybody sitting here, everybody sitting at a blue bomber game, everybody we meet on the street and say, my purpose in life 
is to be astonished that these people who are sacred and bear the image of God share this planet with me. That's one thing. Second thing that occurred to me as I listened to this parable of Mary, Martha, and Jesus about listening and being active is a reminder that God does both. God both listens and God is active. It's the story of Exodus. The story of Exodus, the slaves being free, begins with the slaves. They don't even cry out to God. They just cry out that this is wrong and that life is unjust and we are oppressed. And the story of Exodus begins with them crying out and God listens and God responds by calling Moses and them into the wilderness. That God is a God who says we listen and then we do justice. Walter Brueggemann says justice is to figure out what belongs to whom and then return it to them. Somebody said justice means it's never just us. It's always us in relationship. It's always community. I think one of the problems with saying there's better parts is that we stop listening to others because we assume we've got the better part. That was part of the original United Church of Canada apology to indigenous people. We didn't listen. We just assumed we had God and we're going to introduce you to God and we didn't listen to your experience of creator. And we're sorry that we didn't do that. Affirming congregations. Seems to me part of the affirming movement is we listen to a God who keeps pushing our understandings of how to love and who to love and what the image of God means. And that sexual orientation and gender identity don't create better parts, better people. That somehow they are also part of God's grace God's blessing, that God listens and God acts and then invites us to live with that hope, to realize we can't live just by certainties, we live by possibilities, that there can be peace, there can be a different world, that we can be summoned beyond the known. You may have seen the images from the Webb telescope of the galaxies. And if you've seen them with the old ones, the old ones kind of show you a little spots. And then this one shows you so much more. It seems to me that's what Jesus keeps inviting us to do. God will keep showing us better definition, so much more of God's love and how we are to love. It's what Jesus kept doing. He kept inviting people a table. And it's like he says to us, invite people to your table, but have lots of other leaves for your table because you're going to have to keep expanding it to the point where you go I've lost control of the guest list here and then you realize I never had control of the guest list because it's not my table it's God's table and it's God who welcomes and God who invites because it's God's world somebody once asked Dorothy Day the um, who initiated the Catholic worker movement about the passage in the Bible where Somebody says to Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And he asks for a coin and he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God's what is God's. And they asked Dorothy Day, what do you think of that? She thought a moment and then she said, if we were to render unto God all the things which are God's, there'd be nothing left for Caesar. We rendered unto God all the things that are God's, there'd be nothing left for Caesar because it's God's world. We listen to God, who then invites us to act in that spirit of Christ, to offer healing and forgiveness and to feed others, to distribute the resources, the blessings of God's creation, to live in nonviolence. We worship not just so we can find a statement of belief to obey, but we can learn and practice to embody God's love in all we do. And the last thing I want to say is about choosing the better part is we don't always get to choose our part. Moses didn't want to go down and confront Pharaoh. Abram and Sarah were told by God, you're leaving where you are settled to go someplace else. Mary was invited into the mystery of God's birthing. Disciples 
didn't know what really what they were after. They thought they were after honor. They were after service and love. We don't always know what our part is or where God is in that. And it varies, I think, through life. Again, Richard Rohr, who's a Franciscan priest, talks about two halves of life. He says the first half, we develop our identity and we create families and we get jobs. In the last half of life, we start to wonder about who we really are. I was talking a few weeks ago to a couple of people very successful in their careers, now retired, and they said, you know, when we worked, we knew who we were. That defined us. And we were good at what we did, but now it's a nice memory and we're respected for what we did, but we're not doing that anymore. And now we're starting to discover who we are and what that means. God sometimes invites us to be places that we never expected to be. Ellie Wiesel, in one of his books, talks about somebody coming to a rabbi who just moved towns. And he said, the last time I was in, I used to pray and study. It was great. And here, life just seems so confused. I want to get back to prayer and study. I'm just suffering and crying all the time here. And the rabbi looks at him and says, what makes you think God is more interested in your prayer and study than in your tears and your suffering? This is not a place any of us want to be, but maybe a place where we discover God in a new way. We're invited to know that we aren't always able to choose our part. That always, wherever we are and whatever part we play, God is with us. So I invite you, after the service, to do your own thinking about this parable. You're discussing about the places, the parts God calls us to be, places that unsettle us and transform us, but that remind us that God is not finished with creation and God is not finished with us, that we're called both to listen and to act, to wonder and to do justice, and to discern love and to share love, and to know God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. On our table are gifts that have been presented as offering. Those offering gifts are also made regularly through PAR programs, through Canada Helps for one-time donations and for regular donations. In all the ways that we give, of ourselves, of our time and our talents, we give to God for God's mission and ministry in this world. I invite you to join as we see, remain seated and sing, your work, O oh God, needs many hands.
this anthem, we say amen. Amen. We come to pray today to offer our blessings upon one another and upon our world, and we offer our prayers for the needs of this world, of which there are so many. And we begin calling ourselves to prayer as we sing from Voices United 949. The words are in the service bulletin, the musical setting 949. Oh God, hear my prayer. of the varieties of this world. So we offer our praise to you, O God, for these prairies and for hills and mountains. We give thanks for rivers and springs and lakes and seas and oceans. We give thanks for deserts and mountaintops for all the places in which we can be filled with awe and wonder. We give thanks to you for plants growing in earth and water, for life inhabiting lakes and seas, for life creeping in soils and land, for creatures living in wetlands and waters, for life flying above earth and sea, for beasts dwelling in woods and fields. How many and wonderful are your works, O oh God. You have made them all. We give thanks, O oh God, also for the privilege of companionship with your creation. We give you thanks for people around this earth whose names and faces we do not know, but who nevertheless share this loving planet. As a community who comes together today, we pray particularly for those gathered from the T. Bajigan congregations. We pray today for the congregations of Transcona Memorial, Birds Hill, John Black Memorial, Emmanuel, Gordon King Memorial, the Big Red Church, Gray Street, and North Kildonan congregations. We pray for leadership in these congregations, and we pray for the people who fill these congregations with love and life. As we think about those people, we know that in each congregation, there are people whose needs we know. Some in hospital, some with COVID, some in care homes, some who are away traveling, some who are at the lake. We pray, O oh God, for people that we know. And we pray beyond our own walls and congregations for the people around this globe. O oh God, this creation is hurting. And we see the news each day of more wildfires. And so we particularly pray for the people of Canada, the US and the Mediterranean battling wildfires. We pray for those experiencing the extreme heat in this globe, particularly the people of Canada, 
the people of Europe. We pray for people who live in parts of the world where the climate extreme has meant that they no longer know what to expect on any day. Oh God, help us to bring healing to this planet. We pray for parts of this world torn apart by violence. Sometimes it's in a simple home and sometimes it's in a great nation. And so, oh God, we pray for peace in our homes and in our lives. And we pray for peace in our world. Particularly today, we continue our prayers for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia. Oh God, we pray for the people of Sri Lanka. Oh God, and in, in the light of our prayer light, Oh God, we think about all of the prayers for peace that have been offered. Holy God, help us to live in companionship with your creation and with each other. Hear our prayers, oh God, for we offer so many silent prayers in our hearts and in our minds as we join together and say the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when we gather to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is found in Voices United. It's number 337. We sing Blessed Assurance. Let's go forth in this service to listen with God and to act with God, to be sources of healing and blessing in the world. Go in peace and in love, in the name of God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us, this day and always. Amen.